Hey everyone, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. So today we're going to talk about the Pleiades Open Star Cluster, which perhaps is one of the most famous uh, star clusters uh, in the night sky. I say that because it's relatively uh, easy to spot with the naked eye, certainly with binoculars, if you know where to look. Um, and this makes it very uh, a very good target for beginner uh, astrophotographers. Um, but it's also a little bit tricky because you have these very bright stars and you have this very faint nebula, a uh, reflection nebula that you're going to try to grab. Uh, so I think it's a really, uh, a really good tar uh, target to exercise on. Um, I recently uh, did a short sequence of broadband exposures on this target. I did it on the 20th of February where we had an 88% illuminated moon. But I didn't want to lose the uh, otherwise clear skies. So um, most of this video is going to be a tour of that image because I think it's a fascinating image and I think it's very interesting. And uh, I'll certainly integrate some of the technical details behind uh, uh, what rig I used and settings. But largely this is going to be a tour of the astronomical um, object itself and why I think it's so fascinating. So I, I think there's something here for everyone. Um, uh, certainly hope you guys enjoy this video. And if you are into astronomy and all things astrophotography, then I think uh, you're going to like this channel. So go ahead and subscribe. Uh, I publish content uh, every week, often twice a week. And I think there's a terrific community that's developing here and supporting the channel. So I'd love to have your support as well. And with that, let's jump into the video. Okay, so the Pleiades Open Star Cluster is a grouping of stars that it's located in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. And it's one of the nearest star clusters to Earth, and it's visible to the naked eye. It's also known as M45, which is the Messier 45 number from his catalog. And um, it has a common name uh, called the Seven Sisters. And we'll get into that a little bit. It's visible all year round, actually from both hemispheres. But if you're in the northern hemisphere, it's best viewed in the fall and or the winter. And... Uh, Taurus itself can be a tough constellation to recognize by eye for beginners. It's one of the zodiac constellations, which means that the ecliptic crosses the constellation. And the ecliptic, of course, being the path that the sun, the moon, and all the planets seem to follow. And um, I know that probably doesn't help, uh, help uh, most uh, novice guy gazers, but it is something to be aware of and connect to uh, as you become more practiced with, with looking at the night sky. Now, for me, the best way to find Pleiades is, um, at least during the winter months, is to start by facing due south. And, um, and then if you locate... Um, Orion about halfway up the sky where halfway um, uh, so there's the, right above you is what we call the zenith so roughly you know go about halfway a little bit more up the sky towards the zenith and just to the west uh, at least at this time that I, I was uh, uh, doing my imaging which was the 20th of February this is you know roughly around 8 30 at night you know, I, Orion had just crossed the meridian and it was a little bit to the west and, and you'll see Orion. And um, the asterism of, uh, of Orion is very prominent and I think most people, um, uh, the, you can see it and recognize it after it's been pointed out to you. But obviously there's some, the, the key parts of it would be Orion's belt, Orion's shoulders, uh, feet, and then the rest is a, a, a subject for a different video. But if we take Orion's uh, shoulder, and it, it would be his left shoulder, uh, there's a star there called Bellatrix. And if you were to take the angle of the belt and extend from Bellatrix, you will reach a, a, a nice bright star called Aldebaran, which is... Uh, in the constellation of Taurus. If you continue that extension, you will come across the Pleiades open cluster. Okay, when viewing Pleiades by eye, you may be able to see six, seven or so bright stars. Certainly with binoculars, you'll get all of this. And these are what are 
the, these are the seven sisters, and they happen to be the daughters of Atlas and Pleione. And um, there's a really interesting story behind this, but in summary, uh, at one point in time, Orion, a great hunter, was challenged to hunt down all living things on Earth. And Artemis, who put the challenge forward, w wanted to protect these seven sisters, transform these seven sisters into doves, and place them in the heavens. And now Orion is forever chasing them. And, and as the myth goes, Orion has fallen enchanted with them. And so you'll always be able to locate the Pleiades because Orion will be in hot pursuit, right? So that's that's one way of uh, of 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 remembering where Pleiades is relative to Orion. But beyond this mythology, there's so much to appreciate about the Pleiades. But to do so, we're going to need to uh, get a lot closer with the telescope. Okay, so I use my. Astrotech 115 EDT refractor with the ASI 2600mm Pro astronomy camera to capture this image and the effective focal length of that rig is about 644 millimeters. Now the field of view here is around 2 degrees wide, 1.4 degrees high if we were describing as a rectangle and it certainly captures M45 but I do think that you can get a, a more complete picture with a smaller instrument say you know, an 80 millimeter or 90 millimeter refractor. Still, uh, this image captures a lot of the cool M45 features and certainly all of the named stars that, that I intend to talk about in the video. So right away, we see that there are a lot of stars, much more than the Seven Sisters. You know, some of them very prominent, but hundreds of them are, uh, are, are, are visible and they're obviously less intense. You know, this cluster of stars is about 450 light years away, and it has a population of about 1,000 stars. And so the, the, the circle that you see here is the rough bounding of this group uh, in the sky. So uh, we have most of them in focus. Now, these are young stars. They're around 100 million years old, and uh, they may vary between 50 and 150 million years, but but you will pick up that there, the, the overall, there's a bit of a blue hue to the photo. And that's because these young stars, they're very large and very hot. And if you remember back from high school chemistry, the very tip of the blue, uh, blue cone, that's the hottest part of the uh, Bunsen burner flame. Well, that's what's going on here. These are young, hot stars. And uh, you know what? Let's take a tour uh, of this object, and uh, and let me introduce the Pleiades family, uh, which which are some of the name stars that we have here. Okay, so let's first start with the parents of the seven sisters, and we can see here Atlas and Pleione, and um, Atlas um, it was a titan uh, in Greek mythology. This is pre-Olympian god. That's what he was. And he was he was con he was condemned to hold up the heavens on his shoulders. So we we see statues of Atlas and um, references to Atlas all over in all different cultures. Anyway, Atlas itself is a triple star system. It's got a magnitude of about 3.6. That's the apparent magnitude of the star, which is a measure of its brightness. Remember, the lower the magnitude, the brighter the star. Uh, Atlas is about eight times the radius of our sun and about 4.7 times the mass of our sun. So it's a big star, and it is about 430, uh, uh, 430 or so light years away. Now, Pleione, uh, Atlas's wife, uh, she was an oceanic nymph who presided over the multiplication of flock, I kid you not, which probably explains why they have seven children. And, uh, you know, Pleione is a variable binary star system, which means that its brightness, its apparent magnitude, does fluctuate between roughly 4.7 and 5.5. So it's a little bit dimmer uh, than, than Atlas, and it has a variability about it. She's about 2.9 times the mass of the sun and about 3.7 times the radius. Again, still uh, much bigger than our sun, uh, about 450 light years away, not too far away from, from our husband. They seem to stay close. Okay, let's talk about the children. And we're going to start with Alcyone. Alcyone is considered the leader of these sisters. And in mythology, she's associated with aspects of nature and, and motherhood. And Alcyone is the brightest star in the Pleiades cluster, and uh, she's about 443, 70 light years away from Earth. 
We'll go around the horn here and we'll go to um, um, a Marop. Now, Marop is often depicted as the youngest or the smallest of the sisters. Um, she's associated with mortality and she's sometimes portrayed as the lost or hidden sister in mythology. Uh, she is one of the fainter stars in the bunch and her apparent magnitude is 4.18 and uh, she is completely clouded in dust and we'll talk more about that later. Her mass is about 4.25, uh, that of our sun, and she has a radius of 7.7 .7 times our suns. Okay, so Electra. Electra is the third brightest of the sisters, and she's often depicted as the the the, the sister in mourning in mythology. And this has to do. There's a there's a long story about an angry Zeus who destroyed Troy, which one of her children, her sons, was um, uh, I guess a leader within Troy, and so um, she she's got a magnitude of three point seven. Uh, about 4.5 times the mass of our sun and about six times the radius. So not a small star. Um, next, we have Kaleno. And uh, Kaleno is associated with uh, dark and stormy weather. And in some versions of mythology, she is, I think, married to Poseidon, who is, of course, the god of the sea. So Kaleno is a magnitude 5.4, so on the fainter side, with uh, a mass four times that of our sun, and a radius of about 4.4 times that of our sun. Now we've got Tejat. So Tejat is associated with nature and wilderness, and in some versions of mythology, she... Um, uh, is in pursuit by Zeus. Zeus is chasing her down and she transforms herself into a doe to escape him. And I, I have vivid memories of this when I was a child of reading this mythology. And um, I really want to dig up and find out where that was. At any rate, Tajet is a double star with a 4.3 apparent magnitude. And it's about 4.5 times the mass of our sun. Now we get into this really strange setup here, which is Sterope and or Asterope, <laughs> really, the, you know, the, the, this is a binary star system uh, which you really can't resolve with the naked eye, which might explain why um, we, we consider it one star in the Pleiades uh, uh, sister mythology. Um, at any rate, uh, Sterope is um, associated with agriculture and fertility. Um, and, uh, and again, this is a, a two-star system, um, uh, and depending on uh, what catalog you look at, uh, they could point to Steropa, they could point to Asterope. So, you know, just an interesting uh, oddity about, uh, about this cluster. Uh, finally, there's Maya, and uh, Maya is the eldest of the seven sisters, and she's associated with motherhood uh, as well. Um, she is the mother of Hermes, who is the messenger of the gods. And um, uh, Maya is a single star, a magnitude 3.87. That's about uh, 3.7 times the mass of, of our own sun. Well, you know, when we were looking at both Maya, while we're looking at Maya, and uh, if you recall with Merope, there, there are these gaseous kind of uh, uh, clouds that are very apparent um, in, in M45, in the Pleiades. And um, this is a reflection nebula, which is, the, you know, I like to just think of these as these kind of smoky wisps. Um, and um, th this is a star-forming region, and that means that they're young stars, they're hot stars, and they're bright. And so and th there's a lot of interstellar dust that is reflecting the light from the nearby stars. And that gives them this, this faint kind of blue glow. Uh, unlike emission nebula, reflection nebulas don't emit their own light. But instead, they're reflecting and scattering light from, from these nearby stars. And um, actually, these are really beautiful areas. And with more integration time and better, and better seeing conditions, I have a lot of moon glow in this shot. Um, uh, th 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 this can be a, quite a beautiful scene. So anyway, these are just a few of the features of M45. And I think this is a beautiful photograph, despite its technical, um, uh, let's say, its technical deficits. 
Uh, it's not going to win any APOD awards, but it's perfect for for storytelling. And uh, beyond the you know the beauty of this of uh, this deep sky object, it's a gem for stellar and planetary evolution studies. So I'm glad I captured uh, um, this image last week, and I, and I encourage you to go out and try and do it yourself. And for those interested, again, I shot this with my uh, Astrotech 115 EDT uh, refractor using an ASI 2600 uh, MM Pro camera. I shot with a gain of zero, an offset of 50. And I think I took 30 two-minute exposures on each of the broadband channels, including luminance. Okay, everyone, let's call that a wrap on the video. Um, I like doing these videos. It's, it's a lot of fun to learn about the astronomical objects uh, that we're imaging. And uh, all too often, we get caught up in the technicals and trying to pursue the absolute perfect photograph or image. And uh, we forget. You know, we forget about the, the objects that we're observing and or uh, imaging. And so even with a full moon, this just goes to show you can go out there and you can grab an image and you can tell a story with it. In fact, I have two other images, uh, uh, videos I'm going to be doing just like this. Uh, one's going to be on the um, Mark Arians uh, galaxy chain. I actually shot that the same night that I shot the uh, M45, the Pleiades cluster. And then uh, last night or the night before, actually, I was so lucky that I got a window of great seeing and um, I decided to shoot the Rosette Nebula and I got about four or five hours worth of data just enough to really create a, a be I mean really a, I think it's a beautiful image and um, and actually has some good technical merit as well so I have those two videos uh, coming up in the next week or so and um, if you like astronomy and you like all things astrophotography go ahead and subscribe I really would appreciate the support and with that I will see you all on this next video